Welcome back to Classroom Hatchery Television. Today in episode three, we're gonna be checking on our Atlantic salmon eggs and hatcheries. Then we're gonna learn how to identify Atlantic salmon so that we can tell them apart from other kinds of fish. We're gonna be joined by Dr. Catherine Pyman, a fish scientist and a former coordinator of the Bring Back the Salmon program. Catherine's gonna be teaching us a little bit about how to identify Atlantic salmon, a bit about the lives of Atlantic salmon, and a little bit about herself, some interesting jobs that she's had, and her connection to nature that inspires her life work. Then we're gonna be joined by another special guest, Johnny Nene, who is one of our OFAH Fitzsimmons Fish and Wildlife Conservation interns. Johnny's gonna be joining us for the rest of our episodes, bringing us a fun segment called Fishy Facts, where Johnny is gonna be teaching us about other types of cool fish from around the world. Let's start by checking on our eggs and hatcheries. All right, so checking on tank number one. The filter is running. We can see the waterfall coming out of it. The air pump is running with bubbles coming out of the air stone. And our temperature is three degrees Celsius. Now our target for this tank is four degrees, but it isn't going to hold steady at exactly that temperature. It will vary between three and five, so this is okay. Now that we have our eggs, we'll also check on them. What I'm looking for is to see if they're starting to hatch, and also to see if any of them have turned white, which means that they are dying. We likely will have some that will die. That is perfectly normal. But if there are a bunch of them dying, then we might have an issue that we need to resolve. None of them have turned white, and none of them are looking like they're getting close to hatching. Let's check on tank number two. Filter, check. Air pump, oh, Houston, we have a problem. No bubbles are coming out of the airstone. So what I'm gonna do with this airstone is I'm gonna start back over here where it's plugged in and make sure it's got power. I follow the cord along and I see that it's plugged in and I know that this receptacle has power because the filter is also plugged into it. But maybe it's just this one plug. So I'll unplug it, plug the filter in where it was plugged in, and that filter just started right back up. I'll plug the air pump in, and I can actually hear the air pump. Let's have a look at the air pump. Aha! Here's the culprit. It's come unplugged. It must have gotten pulled off maybe when I was moving something around. It was working yesterday, so it probably happened today. So I just got to make sure that that's nice and tight on there. Oh, and there goes. There goes our bubbles. All right, the air pump has been fixed. The hose got pulled off. Let's check the temperature. And the temperature of tank number two is seven degrees Celsius. So it's sitting right at the temperature we want it to be. Let's check the eggs in this tank. And once again, I'm looking for any eggs that have turned white. And that might happen. We might get some. But if we start seeing a lot go white, then we, we know that there might be something wrong in there. Everybody's looking pretty good right now. And they look pretty much identical to what they looked last week. So over the course of a week, there hasn't been much of a change, nothing that we can notice anyway. There's probably actually been a fair bit of change that's gone on inside the egg. So tank number two is now good as well. Once we rectified that air stone problem. Both tanks are good. If you fish, it's important for you to know and follow the rules about when and how many of a particular species you can target and keep. When it comes to Atlantic salmon, this is extremely important 
so that we're able to bring this important species back to Lake Ontario. If you fish or if you don't, learning how to identify different species of fungus, plants and animals apart from one another can be a doorway into learning about the wonderful diversity of life that exists on our planet. How do we tell one species of fish from other species of fish? In simple terms, we're looking at characteristics of shapes, sizes, colors, the presence and absence of certain body parts, and the placement of body parts in relation to other parts of the fish. Some fish have unique features, like barbels. Some have one dorsal fin, some have two. Some have stripes, and some have spots. The salmon family, collectively known as salmonids, include salmon, trout, char, freshwater whitefish, and grayling. They all have slender bodies, and this fleshy fin on their back, near their tail, called the adipose fin. Some members of this group, like lake trout, have a dark body with light spots, and other members, like our Atlantic salmon, have a light body with dark spots. In Lake Ontario, there are several species that look like Atlantic salmon. The rainbow trout, brown trout, chinook salmon, and coho salmon. I'll now turn it over to Catherine to teach us how to identify Atlantic salmon from these species. How do we classify life? How do we look at a living creature and know what to call it? What if you call it something different than I call it? If you said you saw a robin in your backyard, then your friends and family would probably know what you meant. But what if you talked to somebody in Europe, or India, or Japan? Common names can vary from place to place, or across time, or across cultures. That's why Carl Linnaeus in 1735 came up with a way to classify living organisms using a binomial or a two-part name that would stay the same no matter where that species was found. The first part of the name reflects the genus, and the second part of the name reflects the species. For example, Atlantic salmon are in the genus Salmo, and their species identity is Salar. Like other species, the common name, Atlantic salmon, is not used everywhere. These fish have also been called by bay salmon, black salmon, Kaplan skull salmon, fiddler, silver salmon, and outside salmon. And the landlocked strains are called Sebago salmon or Wananish. Let's have a quick look at the tree of life. We start from kingdom and go all the way down to species, Atlantic salmon. In the genus Salmo, we find our Atlantic salmon. We also find brown trout, Salmo trutta. These species are closely related and are often confused for each other because they look similar. So how do we tell them apart? Either when we're looking in the streams and seeing young fry, maybe we're doing surveys and we're capturing par in the fall, or when we're angling for adults. In Lake Ontario, Atlantic salmon are native. So are brook trout and lake trout, both of which are in the genus Salvolinus. The other salmon and trout that are encountered have been introduced from other parts of the world. Brown trout are native to Europe, not North America. Pacific salmon and rainbow trout are native to the west coast of North America, not to the Great Lakes. So instead of one species of salmon and two distinct looking species of trout, we now have four additional species to identify. Brown trout in the genus Salmo, and rainbow trout, Chinook salmon, and coho salmon in the genus Oncorhynchus. First, let's look at how to identify juvenile fish. They can be tricky, but here's a couple key traits to look out for the color of the fins, and the spots on the side of the body. In juvenile coho salmon, they have a white leading edge on their anal and dorsal fin, which is usually followed by black. When these fish get a little bit bigger, the leading edge of the anal fin becomes much longer than the rest of the anal fin. These fish also have long and narrow par marks on their side. Chinook salmon do not have any white on their anal or dorsal fin. 
Compared to coho salmon, their par marks are a little bit shorter and wider. Can you tell these two juveniles apart? Which is a coho and which is a chinook? Next is brook trout. The back of the adipose fin is dark and there's an orange tint to some of their fins. They usually have eight or nine par marks. They're fairly wide and in fact, they're about as wide as the eyes of a fish. When these young fish are a little bit bigger, there is a white edge on the lower fins. Rainbow trout tend to have fairly narrow par marks. As they get a little bit bigger, their adipose develops a black line that completely surrounds it, and they have a white tip on the dorsal fin. Brown trout tend to have an orange adipose fin, and their par marks tend to be fairly wide. They'll often have many orange dots on their side as well. Atlantic salmon have a clear adipose fin and do not have white or black marks on their other fins. They have fairly wide par marks as well, and if they have any red dots, they tend to be in a single line along the side of the fish. As these fish get bigger, it gets much easier to tell them apart. The trickiest one is still brown trout versus Atlantic salmon. So let's look at that tail. In brown trout, the tail is not deeply forked. The center rays of the tail are more than half the total length of the tail. Atlantic salmon have a deeply forked tail. The center rays are about half the total length of the tail. The pectoral fins are longer in Atlantic salmon than they are in brown trout. Brown trout almost always have orange in the adipose fin, whereas Atlantic salmon rarely have orange in the adipose fin. Finally, the tip of the dorsal fin in brown trout often has a white spot. That white spot is lacking in Atlantic salmon. For identifying the adults, we're going to focus on five different species. Obviously, Atlantic salmon and also brown trout. And also our three Pacific species are coho salmon, chinook salmon, and rainbow trout. So the first thing to look at is the gill plate or operculum. Does it have spots on it? If it does have spots, then you're in the genus Salmo. You have either a brown trout or an Atlantic salmon. If it doesn't, then you're an Oncorhynchus. You have either a rainbow trout, chinook salmon, or coho salmon. So let's assume the fish that you saw does not have spots on the gill plate. The other thing that it should have is spots on the tail. These three species all have spots on the tail, but they differ by how much. A rainbow trout has many spots and lines on the tail. It also has a pale mouth. Chinook and coho salmon both have dark mouths. A chinook salmon also has a fully spotted tail, whereas a coho salmon only has spots on the upper lobe of the tail. If the fish you saw does have spots on the gill plate, then it likely does not have spots on the tail. To tell these two species apart, there are two key things I want you to look at. One is the length of the mouth. Brown trout have large mouths. In brown trout, the maxillary, that upper part of the mouth, will extend past the eye. Whereas in Atlantic salmon, the maxillary stops before the end of the eye. The other thing to look at is the tail. Brown trout have what's called a square tail. The edge of the tail fin is a straight line, whereas in Atlantic salmon, they have a forked tail. That edge of the tail fin is indented. There's a couple other things you can look at as well. Brown trout tend to still have orange in their adipose fin, whereas Atlantic salmon do not. And brown trout tend to have much more spotting that goes farther down their body compared to Atlantic salmon. So let's play a little game. Can you identify this fish? What about this fish? Now let's talk a little bit about life history variation in Atlantic salmon. Atlantic salmon show variation in how long they stay in different life stages. As juveniles, they might spend one or two or three years in the stream. In other parts of the world, they might live in a stream for up to eight years. There is so little food in the stream, it takes them that long to grow big enough to be able to smolt and migrate downstream. Smolts tend to migrate downstream in early spring. That fish that leaves this year, they might spend one, two, or three years in the lake. When an adult finally migrates back upstream, 
they tend to either reduce feeding or stop feeding completely. That means they're using their internal energy stores to prepare for spawning. Part of that involves resorbing some of the calcium in the scales on their body. As a biologist, we can take one of those scales and look at it under the microscope. That tells us that this fish came and spawned last year. You can actually see the mark where that spawning fish had resorbed some of that calcium. And then that fish had survived that spawning, migrated back to the lake, grew even more, and had returned again in 2020 to spawn for the second time. You can also see that there is a wider spacing between the lines that indicates faster growth when this fish was in the lake compared to the narrower spacing between the lines that indicates slower growth when this fish was still in the stream. As a fish migrates upstream to find spawning habitat, it might encounter barriers. There are two types of barriers. We have natural barriers, often in the form of waterfalls, and we have man-made barriers. Often we want to get fish past the man-made barriers. Natural barriers are neither good nor bad. They are what species evolve with. There will be different communities above the barrier compared to below the barrier, and so they are just part of the landscape. Still, watching that Chinook salmon trying to jump that barrier, you feel a little bad for the fish. But it will simply turn around, go back downstream, and find an appropriate place to spawn. Where we have man-made barriers, we often use fishways to get fish past these barriers. In two of the barriers on our streams, we have fish cameras. Imagine you're a biologist and your job is to identify and tell apart each of these five species. And in some years, there are over 25,000 fish swimming past. Not an easy task. Animal migration is fascinating. The sheer abundance of critters that move from one place to another, even in our own backyards, is amazing. We used to have Atlantic salmon, American eel, and other species that would migrate upper streams to spawn. They used to number in the hundreds of thousands. Our streams at that point were open and accessible, and we hadn't destroyed the habitat by cutting down trees. And when we started to alter that, we lost the abundance of our native species. Many other species travel upstream in smaller numbers to spawn, such as white sucker, bass, and brook trout. All of these species, and more, still try and migrate upstream to spawn. They leave behind their eggs, and then a proportion of them would die. Some species, like Chinook salmon and coho salmon, always die after they spawn. It's part of the life cycle. Once they come upstream, every single fish will die. Other species, like rainbow trout, brown trout, and Atlantic salmon, can all survive spawning, and a proportion will come back in subsequent years. But all those carcasses left behind, those dead fish, they provide nutrients for the streams. They feed algae, they feed invertebrates, and they even feed other fish. Even some of the eggs during spawning get eaten by other fish, which may be an important food resource for these young fish. So that means all of these nutrients brought into our streams each year actually help with the production of more fish. So even though it might look kind of gross, and it might even smell, since we have lost our native species that used to perform the same ecological function, we should be grateful that we have other species that can now fulfill this role. So next time you're outside, I hope you'll appreciate the abundance and the diversity and the function of all these fish. I learned at a really young age that I was fascinated by animal behavior. I really liked knowing why critters are doing what they were doing. So I wanted to be able to study animal behavior and ecology. And so when I went to school, that's what I focused on. And I was very fortunate to be able to make this my career. So I did my master's degree where I studied a really cool species of fish called a stickleback. After my master's, I took a break from school work and I was hired on as a research assistant on a bunch of different projects around the world. Then I was able to do my PhD in California and did field work in the Bahamas in Mexico on two species of birds and study how these species interacted on the wintering grounds. I was then hired in Australia and did work there. I was then lucky enough to be hired uh, at Carleton University in Ottawa, did a whole bunch of projects there, everything from studying brown trout in Denmark to Pacific salmon in BC to snook in Florida 
to pumpkin seed sunfish in Ontario to white suckers in Ontario. And all these experiences were completely amazing. I got exposed to so many different people in so many different places. Um, and it really helped me become the person I am today. After those experiences, I um, transitioned into a nonprofit and my work with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, where I coordinate the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program. This is also a really cool program that I really like because uh, we are restoring a native species, of course, which is, I think, something we should do as human beings. We know exactly why the species has been extirpated from Lake Ontario because of humans, and so we should be the cause of putting them back there, and we should be fixing and righting those wrongs. And that's one thing that's really cool about this program is that Atlantic salmon is an umbrella species. All the projects that we do help everything else that is connected to those water courses, which is everything. So that includes not only invertebrates in the stream, but other fishes as well that eat those invertebrates. And of course, terrestrial animals as well. So birds in riparian habitat that might be eating those adult insects when they emerge from the streams. To of course, humans that uh, have both that aesthetic improvement and water quality improvement well from having water courses that are shaded and cooler, having those riparian buffers that filter water, and having overall cleaner and healthier streams in our systems. It's all connected together and I'm really proud to be part of a program that is restoring and improving that habitat. So I really like all those aspects of the program. I also like being able to work with kids when we are educating them about stewardship and reminding them that they are part of the story now where we can right environmental wrong and not continue to do those in the future. I like working with the public and anglers. I like learning how they view these fish and the angling experience in general. I like being able to walk out and look in a stream and know more about it than I did before. And I really like working with this species. They are such a cool creature and using underwater cameras and actually being able to see what these fish are doing underwater. It's hard with fish, right? Because you're looking usually above the stream at the water and it's hard to see what they're doing. You might see little kind of shapes moving around, but they might be tucked away under the, the banks. They might be tucked away under logs. Um, it's not until you actually put cameras or go snorkeling in the water that you can actually see what these guys are doing. And it's amazing to actually see how many fish are in these streams, how they're surviving, what they're doing, where they're going. And I think that is one of the most important things we can learn is about what these fish are doing kind of on the individual basis. And hopefully, you know, we will have uh, Atlantic salmon once again, raising our waters um, sometime in the not too distant future. I've been so fortunate in my life to be able to travel to some really cool places for research and actually learn about what the animals are doing in these different places. I went up to Barrow, Alaska. Barrow is the northernmost city in the U.S. It is way above the Arctic Circle, so you have 24 hours of daylight, which makes it pretty hard to sleep at night. And I saw some, of course, really amazing things there. And we were researching this bird called the Stellar's Eider. That's the male. This is the female. She is very camouflaged, sitting there on her nest. And these guys only nest when this little critter is abundant. This is called a lemming. Snowy owls nest when there's lots of lemmings, and so the eiders have actually figured out that if they nest when the snowy owls nest, the super aggressive owls actually defend the eiders from predation and actually help protect the chicks. So the eiders only nest when there are lots of snowy owls. I was lucky enough to actually be able to see some of the snowy owls up close. I did this with one of the owl biologists, and uh, the particular female owl near this nest had stopped doing her um, attacking, and so we had gone up to the nest following their protocol. And then suddenly, I felt something whack me on the head. And you don't hear owls approach. That's the whole idea. They have specialized edges to their feathers that make their flight silent. And so neither of us expected the owl to do one final attack, and that happened to be on my head. I was lucky she had her talons um, balled up together, so I only got a little bit of a, a talon in the head there, just a little bit of blood. It was quite an amazing experience. Another place I went was called East Amatuli Island. This is off the west coast of Alaska, near the Aleutian Islands, and there are thousands of birds there nesting on the cliffs. And we were studying four different species, two that nested on the cliffs and two that nested in burrows on the ground. At the same time, of course, we saw a bunch of really cool critters. We had humpback whales foraging around the island pretty much every day. At low tide, we went out and looked at the tide pools to find starfish and anemones. And we were living in some pretty rustic conditions. We were living in tents 
with only satellite communication to the mainland. One of the most beautiful places I've been to is Iceland. It has all the different parts of a landscape you kind of wish for. It has glaciers, it has boiling mud, it has waterfalls, it has pretty much everything. And it has really cool critters. So we were studying a couple of different species of fish there. And of course they have a whole bunch of different birds that we don't see here in North America. One of my favorite places was this really tiny island called Turn Island that is 500 miles west of the Hawaiian Islands. So we are literally in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There is nothing around us except for water. It's the first place where I saw the impacts of plastic pollution directly on other animals. So the albatross will forage uh, on the open water. They will pick up things on the surface of the water. There might be food attached to them, there might not, but they will swallow those thinking they're food and bring them back and regurgitate them to their chick. Unfortunately, the chick is then full of plastic. It can't expel that plastic. It sits inside, it feels like it's full, and it simply sits there and starves to death. And it was actually pretty heartbreaking to see that these birds were dying because their parents were picking up trash literally in the middle of the ocean with nothing around us for hundreds and hundreds of miles, and yet there was still trash washing up on the, on the beaches every single day. Thanks for listening. I enjoy telling you a little bit about myself and how I came to be where I am today. But there's more to me, of course, than just work. I enjoy interacting with nature in a variety of ways. I'm a photographer and an artist as well. And every time I go outside, I am looking through the lens of learning what the creatures are doing. And I see something new every single time I go outside. It can be a beetle on the ground. It can be the shape of a leaf. It can be a, how a tree is growing. Keep your eyes peeled when you're outside. You will always see something cool and amazing because nature is awesome. And welcome everybody. I'm Johnny Nene, and I'm the OFAH Fitzsimmons Financial Group Fish and Wildlife Conservation Intern. And I'll be your host through a series of segments called Fishy Facts. During these episodes, I'll be giving you guys a scoop on some cool native, invasive, and exotic fish species from around the world. Together, we'll investigate their life histories and unique adaptations that illustrate the incredible diversity of fish. And to kick things off, I've got something special for you guys this week. We're gonna talk about an ancient fish from our own backyard, the lake sturgeon. Let's take a look. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about lake sturgeon. Lake sturgeon are Ontario's largest and longest living freshwater fish. They're ancient and they've remained largely unchanged for 200 million years. And they're huge. They can reach lengths of 2.2 meters and weigh over 240 pounds. That's heavier than the average NFL linebacker. They can also reach ages of over 150 years old. But what do they look like? Let's take a look. Here we have a replica of a lake sturgeon. As you can see, they have torpedo-shaped bodies with elongated snouts that have four barbels underneath on the ventral side. Their heads are bony, but their internal skeletons are made mostly of cartilage, which is the same stuff that our noses are made out of. They also have five rows of bony plates that run along their body called scutes, which slowly disappear as the fish grow older. Young lake sturgeon can be gray or brown to greenish gray in color and have varying degrees of black splotches that slowly disappear once they reach about 60 centimeters in length. Adults, as you can see, are gray or olive brown with white bellies. Lake sturgeon live in cool waters at the bottom of deep lakes, rivers, and streams. They prefer sandy or silty substrates, but have also been found over gravel and cobble. They're bottom feeders, and they use the barbels under their snout to help them detect their prey items, which can consist of worms or leeches, aquatic insect larvae, mollusks, crayfish, or other small organisms. They lack teeth so they use their extendable lips to suck up their prey items as they're cruising along the bottoms. And lake sturgeon take a very long time to reach maturity. Males 
aren't ready to spawn until they're about 20 years of age and females not until they're about 25 years of age. Once reaching maturity, a female may only spawn once every four to six years and they'll travel up to 400 kilometers to their spawning grounds which are in fast flowing streams. Depending on their age and size, a female may lay up to half a million eggs at one time. The eggs are deposited over top of rocks and logs to which they adhere. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of lake sturgeon in Ontario. Lake sturgeon were once prolific across all the Great Lakes. However, intense commercial fishing between the mid 1800s and early 1900s took a massive toll on their population. Many populations have yet to recover and there are currently three populations that are listed as at risk in Ontario. Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed learning about the lake sturgeon as much as I've enjoyed sharing with you. So please be sure to tune in next time where I'll have some more cool and exciting fishy facts. Thanks guys, we'll see you next time. It can be difficult to remember all of the details that distinguish one species from another. For centuries, naturalists have been using art to help them. Drawing is one of the best ways to do this. By drawing a species, be it a flower, a bee, or an Atlantic salmon, you put it on paper and into the depths of your mind. Thank you, Johnny and Catherine. In our next episode, we're going to be learning about Atlantic salmon life cycle from our friend Kat Lucas from Ontario Streams. Until then, keep on swimming upstream.